If I could, maybe a couple of students or all that would go get those prayer books that are at the back. How many of you already have a copy of the Praying Your Word for the Church? All right. I want you to go ahead and get a copy. If you choose that you don't want it, then you can just leave it in the pew where you're at. But this way you'll have a copy and you won't have to get caught up back there in the back. Uh, but as they come around, if you would just tell them, if somebody would go upstairs and make sure the upstairs has copies. The only reason there's going to be any power within that book is because the Word of God is in that book, and we pray the Word of God together. The power is in God and His Word, not in you and I. And uh, But I want you to have a copy of that, so... Um, I'll just go around and offer those, and if they already have one, they'll let you know that. Um, I'm going. If you want to find in your Bibles a passage of Scripture, I'm going to invite you to turn to Second Chronicles chapter seven, and we will get there um, this morning. Second Chronicles chapter seven. In light of me asking us as a church to embark on a 31-day journey of praying together, I want to focus us a little bit this morning on this topic of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. It means that we're to always be in an attitude of prayer. Matthew 21 and verse 22 tells us that if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14 say this, Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So many times we want to look at verses 13 and 14, and we want to say that, you know, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. And we may stop right there and we forget the next phrase that says, so that my Father might be glorified. He, he doesn't do things to glorify you and I. God answers prayer and God, God works for our good and His glory. And we must not lose sight of that. And He even tells us in that verse 12 that we will do greater works than He did. Not because we're greater than Him, but because He's going to finish the work because he's going to go to the Father in heaven. That's a sermon in and of itself. May come back there someday. But he's, he's going to the Father. And because he's going to the Father, you and I have the power available to us to do greater works than even Jesus did. Not because of us, but because of him. So that if we ask anything in his name, he will do it. Jeremiah 33, 3, we know that verse as well. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and unsearchable things which you do not know. Could I just give you three or four things that ought to be on every person's prayer radar? We, we ought to be praying for the persecuted church. There are believers around this world that put their life on the line every moment of the day for the cause of Christ. And you and I get a little ruffled when they tell us that we can't carry our Bible to work or we can't play this radio station at work or whatever it may be for you. We need to pray for the persecuted church. We have a bulletin board out. As you go out these back doors, has a a brochure you can pick up and we highlight a, a country or an, a region or a church or a group on a regular basis. You ought to be praying for your country and for your military. We're doing military Bible sticks this, this month. That's a reminder to us that we have men and women that are out there protecting the freedoms that we enjoy. Reminded that there are countless that have given their lives for that cause. That we have men and women that are making decisions every day that impact us. They need the Lord as their guide. We ought to be praying for them. We are constantly around folks that are hurting and grieving. I had a 35-minute conversation, maybe 45 minutes, I don't know. It was 30 to 40-minute conversation yesterday. I just went over to say hi to somebody and introduce myself, and I walked away 40 minutes later broken 
even more so for the church. This, this person had grown up in church, served in the church, did, helped with, get this, helped with funeral dinners through that church. Her husband passed away. And nobody, no, listen to me, nobody from that church a year and three weeks later has called her, come by her house, or done anything. The preacher showed up for the funeral and they had to ask him to stop before he got finished. There are grieving and hurting folks around us. And we need to pray for them. But beyond prayer, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We talked last week about caring, and I, I had this conversation with this person this week. It was just amazing. Just broke my heart for the church that, that we, we sit around and we read our scripture and we know what we should be doing and we even have proddings from the Spirit of God and yet we don't respond to those. It's just a reminder that we need to come alive as the church of God and, and, and do something with the faith that we have. Because aside from, from God's grace doing something remarkable, that person will probably never walk back into church again. I could go on to tell you, you want to know the one person that's been by her side through all of that? A person that doesn't even believe in God. Doesn't do much to us to kind of talk against that. Why does anybody need God when the church of God doesn't show up when we're needed? It's just a reminder to me, that's not the message, but it's just a reminder to me that we really do need to become a caring group of people. Contacting, assisting, building relationship, relating, and encouraging because there are people all around us that are in need of that. And we need to be sensitive enough to the Spirit that He would guide us and and we would and do something with that. So we need to pray. And then as God touches our heart in any of these areas, we need to act upon that. And the other area, obviously, for us today is that we ought to pray for the church. That's why I'm giving you a book, little two-page chapters, if you would, a scripture, and then you turn around and you read that prayer and you personalize that prayer for our church, for you, and for whatever the blanks may be in there. And you pray that word for the church. 31 days of prayer, starting Wednesday. If you're already planning to miss a day or two, go ahead and get started. But I'd really encourage you to start on Wednesday and then make up if you miss something. Because there, there'll be power as the church, listen, church praying corporately even though we're scattered. That this is a tool that we can have that would get us all praying the same thing for the same body of believers over the course of the same day expecting God to do something. Ask what you will in my name and I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 13. That's, we want... God to do something in our midst for His glory. Pray for the unconverted. Pray, pray for the lost. Pray for the unconnected. Those that are wandering around. Pray for the complacent. Those that are apathetic towards the things of God. And pray for the committed. That active, devoted follower of Christ. Pray. Would you join me in praying for the Lord to help us as a church reach 1% of Glenpool? Oh, 1%. Louis, not a, if we had 130 people here this morning, 
That's 1% of Glenpool. We have 1% of Glenpool that worships on an ongoing regular basis here at our church. Can we, can we reach 1% of Glenpool? 1% of the lost and the unconnected? Folk, I love dearly committed folks. But my, my passion is not for us to go to somebody that's devoted and connected somewhere and investing their life somewhere and say, hey, come over here. It's, it's about reducing the lost and the non-attending within our community. Reaching 1%. Reducing lostness. Increasing connectedness. Our, our revival that we're going to do, this fall focus is all about increasing connectedness, reducing apathy, and increasing commitment. That's what it is. When we do those things, reaching the lost will happen because we'll understand and get revived in the sense of what we've had and we'll go out and talk about it and what God's doing in our midst and folks will want to come. We'll go out there and reach them and we will bring them with us. 1% of Glenpool. Some things for us to be praying for. Some things that over the course of the next weeks you'll be praying for as we pray for our church. Some very specific things that we'll lead ourselves to pray for in corporate gatherings together. Why don't you begin to pray? Pray for the church. Pray for the unconverted, the unconnected, the complacent, the committed. And here's three things for this morning. That we would ask the Lord to revive His church. Growing us spiritually. Growing us spiritually. I, I'm going to get to Second Chronicles. It's alright. We'll get there. We may finish it next week. But we'll get there. Colossians 4.12 says this. Paul's writing, he says, hey, Epaphras, he's, he's one of you. He's a servant of Christ Jesus. He sends you his greetings. Listen, this is what Epaphras is doing for the church at Colossae. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. Just, just stop and think about that. How long has it been since you've wrestled with God for somebody in prayer. Would you, would you wrestle for me in your prayers? Would you wrestle for your spouse, for your kids in your prayers? Would you, would you spend some time wrestling for your deacons? For your Sunday school teachers? For your friends? Epaphras, one of us, a servant of Christ, he wants you to know he's always wrestling for you in his prayers. Why? So that you will be able to stand mature and fully assured in everything that God desires and wills. He wants you to grow spiritually. Would your prayer, Lord, revive this church. Grow us spiritually. Give us a desire that you, you could read the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. I preached on that way back at the beginning of the year. But strengthen you with power that we would be able to comprehend God's love. Grow us in such a way that we could stand firmly established in our faith. He goes on to say that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro in, in all of the doctrines and all the junk of this world, but we would know the truth. Lord, revive your church. Grow us spiritually. Lord, revive the church. The second thing is strengthen our commitment. We have preached and taught and read the scripture that we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself, right? That we would strengthen our commitment to love the Lord. That we would strengthen our commitment to love one another. That we would 
strengthen our commitment to grow in God's word, that we would strengthen our commitment to serve him in ministry, that we would strengthen our commitment to share the good news. In essence, that we would gather, grow, and go as God's people. That's, that's what we exist to do. To, to gather in, in worship and adoration and love for the Lord and, and grow in our relationships with one another and our understanding of God and His Word and that we would go in service and in sharing. Lord, revive the church. Strengthen our commitments. Where are you in that? What areas of your life need to be Revived, refreshed, uh, breathed life into? What, what needs to happen there in your life? Growing spiritually? Strengthening your commitment? Thirdly, Lord, revive the church. Fill your sanctuary. Fill it, Lord. Second Chronicles. 714 and my people who bear my name will humble themselves pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways then will I hear from heaven forgive their sin and heal their land and we love that verse don't we we, we, we claim that verse for our country that if, if my people, if we as God's kids would, would just turn to Him, if we would humble ourselves, if we would pray and if we would seek His face and turn from our wicked ways and if we would do those, He would hear from heaven. He would forgive the sin and He will heal the land. Look at verse 15. This is the Lord speaking. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. And I have now chosen, verse 16 says, and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there at all times. And I try to take just a few minutes this morning. And there, it's too rich. There's, there's too much. But look back to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Get the context for why God says that my people who bear my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll do this. Why? What's, what's that promise? Where, where did that come from? If you, if you don't go back and read, you miss the fact Solomon's in the point of dedicating the temple that he has been allowed to build for the Lord. His dad wanted to build it, but God said, David's not going to, your son will. And Solomon has gotten, gotten the, the privilege of building the temple, the place where God dwells, where the sacrifices would be offered, where the priest would do their jobs, where the worship would take place, where the people would gather. He's dedicating God's dwelling place, the sanctuary. Now just stop there for just a moment and understand that in the New Testament, you want to know what you and I are called? We're the temple of God. We're His sanctuary. He dwells in us, and because He dwells in us, He dwells in this building. We think, and, and we've conditioned ourselves, dear church, to believe that God dwells in the building, and when we come in the building, God fills us. But God fills us and dwells in us, and when we come in the building, He comes in the building. We put way too much on calling this the sanctuary. This is. And when I say, Lord, revive 
the church and fill the sanctuary I want him to fill us and when he fills us and we begin to live changed and converted lives on fire for him for what he's done in our lives guess what the physical filling of this sanctuary will happen reaching 1% of Glenpool will happen Seeing lives that are lost and wandering, coming and being found and connected, will happen. Seeing folks that were once complacent and apathetic in their, in their walk with Christ, will, they will be vibrant, connected, committed followers of Christ. And the ones championing, championing, I, don't, I can't say too many syllables, those that are going to be the champions of that, will be those that choose, those committed, that say, I'm going to stay there, and I'm going to bring others along with me. And I'm not just going to be okay with where I am. I want to continue to grow in my walk, in my life with Christ. And I want to become even more committed to following Him. He is dedicating this temple. He's built. It is a physical building. He begins in verses 12 through 18. He's full of praise and adoration, worship for who God is and, and what He's done. And then in verses 19 through 42 of chapter 6, He just offers all these different pleas and requests, petitions to the Father. Ten or twelve times He says, Hear us, O God. Hear us, O God. Give mercy. Forgive us. Restore us. Revive us. Here's all the things that you have done. Here's all the things that I am asking of you because of who you are and what you've done. Look at verses 40 through 42 of chapter 6. Now, my God, please let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. Now therefore arise, Lord God, come to your resting place, you and your powerful ark. May your priest, Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and may your faithful people rejoice in goodness. Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember the promises to your servant, David. Oh Lord, let your eyes be open, let your ears be attentive to the prayer of this place. To all that has been said and all that is being done, Lord, come, fill this place. Dwell here. That's Solomon's prayer. I, I've had the privilege of building this, but God, your greatness is so insignificant. Your greatness is so great, and what I have done is so insignificant is what I'm trying to get out. In comparison to who you are, this great temple and this great building and structure is insignificant built by human hands. Lord, come dwell here. Chapter 7, verse 1 says, When Solomon finished praying, fire fell from heaven. When Solomon finished praying, fire fell from heaven. And it says it consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest couldn't even get in because the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And all the Israelites were watching when the fire descended and the glory of the Lord came to the temple and they just went out as if nothing happened. You're not reading. Doesn't say that. Come on, church. It says they bowed down and worshipped and praised God for what He had done and shown them. Listen, they bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and praised the Lord for He is good, they said, for His faithfulness endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. The filling of the temple changed the people that were there in the presence of God. And yet we come in and out of this place. And we're never changed. Why? 
because we think we come here to get God and we forget that we've already got him before we get here. We just don't get still enough, long enough to listen and hear from him so that we can understand that he is in us. And that He is strengthening us and giving us the power to be able to grow spiritually and, and impact lostness and do all the things that He's called us to do. Lord, revive the church! Their response. They played music. They clapped their hands. <laughs> they had a two-week party, folks. Chapter 7 goes on to say they, they, they celebrated this for a week. They did this. Then they, they went to their homes. They fashioned this after a feast that they would have been taught to do. All of that. Then we get to verse 12. And Solomon appeared, or the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. And if I shut the sky so there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people, if you go back and read chapter 6, those are all things that, that Solomon has referenced within his prayer God is answering specifically the things that Solomon has talked about in his dedic dedication prayer you can go back through history and see that there was actually a time or there will be a time in which the sky is shut off and there is no rain grasshoppers come and consume the land Mike can remember that right pestilence on my people if, if those things happen and my people, listen, this is the verse we get to. And I love the verse. But we need to understand where it, where it came from. And, and the heart behind him getting to this place of answering the prayer of Solomon. That if I do those things, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself. And my people who bear my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And if they turn from their evil ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. But listen to verse 15. My eyes will now be open, and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. And I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that the name may be there forever, my name. In direct answer to verses 40 through 42 of chapter 6, my eyes are open, my ears are hearing, and and there, attentive to the prayers. And I have chosen and consecrated this temple. I have filled this place. The proper response of God's people, as life happens, as trials come, is to understand that the Lord is with us. Lord, Revive your church. Send your fire once again. Fill this place. Would you ask him in the course of the next 31 days, if God so tarries and gives you and I that long, that he would already have begun a work in our lives? So that when we get together to gather for this idea of a fall focus to, to revive the church of God, we'd be in the midst of it. And that we would see Him do things in and amongst us like we've never seen before. That it would just draw us to fall on our knees before Him on the pavement and worship Him. That... Although we will always be led and encouraged as to what we need to do, we may not have to be told to clap our hands for the Lord. That we may not have to be told, let's stand in adoration for who God is. Could I just, could I just stop for a moment and tell you that during that prayer time that Solomon had in chapter 6, his ded dedication prayer, 
he, he did not pray with hands clasped and head bowed and eyes closed. His posture of prayer was standing on a platform similar to something like this with his arms held high, his palms reached toward heaven, and he was looking to the God in which he was talking to. In fact, the scripture tells us that he not only was that, he was like this before his God. I may not be able to get up, so I'm going to stay right here for the rest, all right? Would we ask God to stir within us a fresh stirring so that no matter what comes, no rain or way too much rain, sickness or health, good, good time, bad time, whatever comes, we would be God's people that call on His name and humble ourselves and keep ourselves clean before Him so that He can do what only He can do. He can forgive. He can change lives. He can connect the unconnected. He can bring the lost into the family of God. He can do those things through His people who let Him fill their lives. Pray, for He is good and His faithful love endures forever. Would you stand with me? Where are you in the midst of this? Where, where does God find you? Is there some area of your commitment, your spiritual growth that needs to be rekindled? Ask him to let it start right now. Don't let it start in somebody else. Say, Lord, let it start in me. Lord, revive your church and let it begin in me. He longs to do a work. He longs to fill you and to fill this place. So let's pray, church. Let's act. Let's be the church that He's called us to be.